Hey everybody, this is Rust from Metro Game Core, and this is the Funny Playing FPGA Game Boy Color. And that's a mouthful, so we're going to shorten that down to FPGBC for the rest of this video. And I've been enjoying this funny little Game Boy for a couple months now, and I'm finally ready to share that experience. And longtime viewers know that I've been on the hunt for a perfect Game Boy experience for years. In fact, I never owned a Game Boy growing up, but I always wanted one, and so I've always been chasing that experience ever since. And all things considered, the FPGBC is the closest I've ever come to that goal. Not only does it emulate the hardware of an original Game Boy, but also a Game Boy Color, and it uses a Game Boy Color shell, so it has a very nostalgic and fitting form factor. And so in this video, we're going to talk about all of its features, what it can and cannot do, and how it stacks up against the competition. After all, there are a ton of different Game Boy-like experiences out there, and most people would probably agree that the most premium among them would be the Analog Pocket. But here's where things get tricky. I've had the Analog Pocket for years at this point, but it doesn't give me the same warm and nostalgic feelings as the FPGBC does. And so you're probably wondering how it is that a device that costs about a third of the price of the analog pocket is actually a better Game Boy experience for me. And I think that's really the heart of this whole video. And so without any further delay, let's go ahead and dive in. Okay, let's start by talking about the price and the buying experience of getting the FPGBC. And there are quite a few places you can pick this up, but I recommend getting it directly from Funny Playing because it's a lot cheaper. You can find the kit for $70. That's going to include the PCB as well as the screen and battery and a speaker. And from there, you can customize it with a variety of different shells and buttons and rubber membranes. And when you put it all together, it comes out to $83.60, and that does include free shipping. And I think that's a pretty amazing deal compared to something like a mod Game Boy Color, which we'll also talk about later in this video. And you've probably already figured this out, but you have to assemble the device yourself. This is not something that's going to come pre-assembled. But thankfully, it's a very easy process, no soldering or anything else like that. I actually think you could probably do it in about 20-25 minutes. If anything, I would recommend you approach it kind of like a Lego set, because it is about that easy to build. Anyway, here's a quick look at all the parts as they came in, but one thing of note is that the PCB does have different versions. The one I have is version 1.1, but I've heard they've already upgraded to version 1.11 at this point. And that version number will come into play when it comes to the firmware, which we'll talk about later in this video. Now, this is not going to be a full assembly guide. I'm trying to not make this video like three hours long. And there's already a great example video out there from Tito over at Macho Nacho Productions. I'll leave a link to his video down below, but he goes over the entire installation process. He's got all these nice fancy angles and everything. And so when you do the assembly, I would just recommend watching his video. All that being said, I'm still going to walk you through the installation process and my experience as I went through. First thing you want to do is test the components to make sure everything is working. So you want to plug in the speaker as well as the battery. I'd also recommend plugging in the screen at this point. I unfortunately forgot to film it. One of the reasons why I'm going to just point you over to Tito. Anyway, once you have everything plugged in, you can turn on the power switch and then verify that you'll hear the little Game Boy ding. And if so, it probably means that everything is working properly. So let's go ahead and start the assembly. So the first thing we want to do is assemble the front part of the shell. That's going to include the buttons and the rubber membranes, as well as the speaker. Of note, when installing the speaker, there's a little gasket you want to make sure that you also include. And then you also want to angle the speaker tilted a little bit to the right side to make sure that the wires aren't going to get in the way. After that, we can add the PCB and then we're going to screw it in using the two Phillips head screws that will come with your kit. Of note, I don't recommend tightening these screws too much, just enough so that they're snug. And so this is one of those areas where you'll have to kind of feel it out yourself, but I do prefer having it just slightly loose. Once you're happy with how the controls feel, then you can plug in the speaker and then just kind of push that wire underneath to get it out of the way. From there, you can add the touch sensor on the top and then the power toggle on the left side. Once those are in place, you can now add the back cover. These are going to be attached by six different tri-wing screws. And if you don't have a tri-wing screwdriver, I'll leave a link to a very cheap set in my video description. And then I'll also leave a link to the kit that I I actually use. It's a little bit more expensive, but it'll last for years and years. Anyway, same story here. I like to make sure that these are snug, but not ultra tight. And of note, two of these screws are found within the battery compartment. And once we have the case screwed in, then we're almost done. All we have to do now is add the battery, and there's going to be a little hole on the left side of the case where you can put in the wire connector. I recommend using a small plastic tool just to make sure that everything is properly seated. And finally, we just have to attach the screen. Be a little bit careful when you're doing this, but you just need to plug in the ribbon cable and then secure it into place. This is probably the trickiest part of the entire installation, but even then, it's still relatively easy. Just take your time. 
And once you have it connected, I would turn on the power just to make sure that you can hear the speaker as well as see the screen. And once everything is working properly, you can go ahead and take off the back of the tape here and then install the screen. Now, unfortunately, as I was filming this, I got a phone call and I used my phone as my primary camera. What I didn't realize is that as the phone was ringing, it turned off my camera. And so I did not film the actual installation of the screen. But it is very simple. It's just a matter of taking off this tape here, putting it into place, and then pushing it down. And again, Tito's video is more thorough when it comes to the installation process, and I'll have that link down below. Regardless, once you have it fully seated, you can then push the screen into place to make sure the adhesive sticks, and then you can remove the little plastic screen protector, and we are good to go. Now, the first thing I would recommend once this is fully assembled is to flash the latest firmware onto this device. Let's go through that process. And it's actually a very simple setup for this as well. You just wanna go back to the Funny Playing website, and on the FPGBC kit page, there's a link to the firmware update. This will take you to a GitHub page that hosts all these firmware files. From there, scroll down and you'll see two different options. It'll depend on the type of PCB that you have. Like I mentioned previously, I have version 1.1, so we're gonna go there. And after scrolling down a bit, you'll see a change log of all the different updates that have released over this past few months. And there have been quite a few updates, in fact, about one a month at this point. As of making this video, the latest release was on March 25th. And so if we go up to the folder structure, you'll see one that is actually labeled with that date. And once we go inside there, you'll find a file that says update.bin. Go ahead and download that. And the update process is written down on this GitHub page and it's super simple. All you have to do is turn on your FPGBC and then connect it to the computer where you downloaded that file via USB. Once it's connected, it's going to pop up as an external drive and all you have to do is take that update.bin file and then drag it over and put it into that drive. And that's gonna immediately flash the firmware and then reboot the device and now you're good to go. And it's really as simple as that. But one thing of note, if you look at the change log, they mentioned that there's a version with a patched bootloader. And so this will be a different version of the firmware that will have a different boot logo. Now I'm not gonna say specifically what this is, but if you want a more authentic experience, I would recommend getting this one instead. And for the rest of the video, that's the bootloader that I'll be using. And so now that the device is fully assembled and we flashed the latest firmware, let's take a look at the overall experience. We're gonna start with the hardware first. Now this is basically an aftermarket Game Boy Color Shell. And so if you've ever owned one of these devices, it's gonna be the exact same experience. The buttons, the membranes, the shape and form of it, all of it feels very familiar. And for me, that's one of the biggest draws of this handheld. Even though it's not using any original parts, it feels very much so like an original Game Boy Color. And in terms of IO, it's very similar. On the left side, we have our link cable port and then below that we have a physical volume rocker toggle and it can also be pressed down that's what's going to open up the end game menu and then on the right side we just have our standard on and off switch there's not a lot going on up top there is that little touch screen button but that doesn't actually do anything on the fpgbc and then finally on the bottom we have our 3.5 millimeter headphone jack and then our usb-c charging port of note when it comes to charging with the usb-c cable depending on the color model that you have you won't actually get any indication that it's actually charging and this really comes into play with the opaque models like my white model here. Now, if I turn off the studio lights and make it a darker environment, you can definitely see that there's a little bit of light bleed from the LED charger, but that's really about it when it comes to an indication that this thing is actually charging. And of course, this will be a moot point if you happen to pick up a transparent shell because you will be able to see that LED charging indicator. And the last thing of note from a hardware perspective is that the battery itself is a little bit loose in the shell because it is aftermarket and doesn't fit perfectly. It's fairly snug in there, but if you were to shake the device, you can hear it rattling in the back. So personally, I would recommend padding it a little bit, maybe a piece of an index card or something like that, just to keep it a little bit tight in the back. Next, we're gonna fire up a couple games and talk about the software experience overall. And we're gonna start with a Game Boy game. This is my Japanese version of Super Mario Land. And you can see that for me, it's booting into the Game Boy Core. You're getting the Nintendo Game Boy logo and everything. And this is that secret custom bootloader that I mentioned earlier. Now, if we press in on the volume toggle, it'll bring up an in-game menu. And so let's go over each of these. We'll start with the backlight one here on top. And the way that you increase and decrease the values is by pressing A and B to go left and right. And you can see here that it gets very bright at the brightest setting. You can play this outdoors, no problem. It does get fairly dim, but I wish it was a little bit less bright just to be able to play it more in the dark. Below that, we have our volume toggle. This isn't really necessary because you can just turn the volume up and down with the button itself. 
And so I'm not really sure why they have this here in the first place since you can just physically turn the volume up and down. Below that we have our display modes, and as of the most recent update there are actually six different options here. So let me walk you through all of these one at a time. The first is going to be X4. This is going to be a four times integer scale of the original screen. And this is going to be the same screen size that you will find in a lot of other aftermarket IPS LCD panels. But bear in mind it will be a little bit smaller than what this screen can do altogether. After that we have the X4P one. This is going to give you a grid overlay with that same 4x integer scale. And this one looks pretty good, although it does darken the screen a little bit. But of course, because this is such a bright screen, it's not really that big of a deal. You can just increase the backlight. Next, we have the full mode screen. This is going to blow everything up to the full size of the screen, but it won't be integer scale. Instead, this is somewhere between 4 and 5x integer scale altogether. This does mean that you'll get a little bit of pixel wobble or shimmering because you have some uneven pixels. But for me personally, I haven't really lost any sleep about the difference between the two, and so I usually just keep it at full screen. Next, we have those same three modes, but with the emu tag attached to it. And these have to do with the desaturation of the colors in the Game Boy Color Core, so we'll test that out later. For now, I want to give you a closer look at the differences between these three screen modes in case one is more important to you than the other. We'll start with the 4x integer scale, which looks nice and crisp. And then we have the X4P, which is going to be the same thing, but with that LCD overlay. And then finally, of course, we have the full screen display, which I think looks the best, even though it isn't quite perfectly integer scaled, I still think it looks very good. Okay, next in the settings list, we have our core options. We have two different ones here, Game Boy or Game Boy Color. And you have to remember these are FPGA cores, which means that depending on the core that you're loading, it's going to behave exactly like that original hardware. So let's try this out by switching over to the Game Boy Color core. Once I've done that, I'm going to go down and save these settings and then reset the console. And when it reboots, as you can see, it's going to show the Game Boy Color boot logo, not the Game Boy one. Because for all intents and purposes, this is now a Game Boy Color. And so this is the exact same visual experience you would get if you plugged in the original Super Mario Land into a Game Boy Color device. Anyway, to switch between the two, you just go back into the settings, change out the core, then save and then reset. And just like that, we're playing with the original Game Boy again, more or less. Next on the options, we have the Game Boy palettes. There are 12 different color options here. And these will all be various forms of colorization and some of these look really great. Personally, I like the number four palette, but I can see some of the other ones being used as well. Our next setting is called Frame Mix, and this is a feature called Frame Blending. Most games will not need this at all, but there will be a couple games that will be more accurate if you turn this on. But those games are going to be few and far between, and I found for the most part, having this on makes things worse than it does with it off. For example, with Castlevania 2, you can see that with frame mix on, it makes the background flicker quite a bit. So generally, I just keep the frame mix off, and if there is a game that is having some sort of visual issue, I'll try to turn it on and see if that helps. But 99 times out of 100, you're probably not going to want to turn this on at all. It's a similar story with the next option, which is called Game Boy Color Fix. For the most part, this one I also turn off. I haven't really found a game where I needed to turn it on. So again, I would recommend playing it by ear and leaving this one off, but if you see something that needs to be fixed, then try to turn it on. Below that, we have our speed option. You can actually adjust the timing of the FPGA. Personally, I've left it at the default setting, but if you want to ramp it up a little bit faster, you can actually play it at one and a quarter speed. One thing of note, there have been complaints that the default speed is not 100% accurate. For example, if you play a game for an hour, it might get a couple seconds off in terms of timing compared to an original console. So if you are looking for 100% accurate gameplay, it does look like this FPGA does have a little bit of wiggle room. For me personally, I haven't found any sort of timing issues, but I did want to mention that because I've read about it online. Below that, you can see the version number of your firmware, and then you can also reset the console. And finally, below that, you can save the settings changes that you make, and then also it'll give you a battery indicator here on the left. And that's really about it when it comes to these settings. The other thing of note is this device is capable of sleep. While you're in a game, just press and hold that volume toggle for a couple seconds and the screen will go black. And this does put the device into sleep mode, and bear in mind it does drain the battery pretty quickly. I found over an 8 hour period it'll drain about half the battery altogether, so it's definitely something you would want to use for a few minutes, but not necessarily a few hours. And before I forget, let me mention that you'll get about 4 or 6 hours of battery life on this device depending on your backlight settings and whether or not you're using an original cartridge or a flash cart. In general, flash carts will demand more power, but I found an average of about 4 to 6 hours of battery life to be pretty accurate. Okay, so that's about it when it comes to playing Game Boy games, now let's talk about playing Game Boy Color. We're going to start by putting in my Mario Golf cartridge and then turning it on. And bear in mind this is still playing with the Game Boy Core, so it's kind of like putting a Game Boy Color game into a Game Boy DMG. 
Some games will work like that, but many will not. And so like, for example, Mario Golf says, no, this isn't gonna work. You need to use it on a Game Boy Color. And of course, that's a very simple fix with the FPGPC. We just have to go into the settings, change the core to Game Boy Color, and then hit save and reset. And just like that, we are now booting into the Game Boy Color and Mario Golf is working great. So while we have this up and running, let's go ahead and talk about those three display modes that are made specifically for the Game Boy Color. And these are brand new as of the most recent update. And if we switch over to these, you'll see that the EMU variations have a a desaturated color scheme. And that is to more accurately represent the original Game Boy Color display. Now, like I mentioned, this has just been updated, but I do hope that they are going to tweak this further because I'm not super happy about this color profile. If we look at them side by side, you can see that yes, on the right, it doesn't have quite as vibrant and bright colors. And to me, that saturation is a little bit more accurate than the super saturated version on the left. However, I did find that the tint of the colors get a little bit skewed when you take away that saturation. In particular, I found things among the red and yellow and orange palettes to be a little bit more green of a tint than I would like. You can see a little bit in the words Mario Golf, but it's a lot more apparent when we play something like Link's Awakening. Here you can see that the yellow parts are just a lot more green looking. And so even though I do prefer less saturated colors on the Game Boy Color, I also really appreciate a better color balance. And so as a result, I've been playing everything in just the standard full display mode. Even though it is more saturated than I would like, at least the colors are better represented. And so that's a quick rundown of getting spun up with the FPGBC. Now I want to talk about what it's like to actually play on this thing and where it makes a lot of sense in certain contexts. We're going to start by playing with a standard Game Boy cartridge. We're going to use Tetris as our example. For me, among all the games that are available for the original Game Boy, this one is the most iconic by far. And I think a lot of people would agree with me. Unless you combine Pokemon Red, Green, Blue, and Yellow, Tetris is the best-selling game on the original Game Boy. And so let's go through a bunch of different scenarios of playing Tetris on random Game Boys that I have available for testing. To start, we'll go with the OG experience. We're going to grab my Game Boy DMG. This one has an aftermarket shell and buttons, but everything else internally is the same. And I did a whole throwback video where I reviewed this device last Last year and kind of looked at it in the lens of 2023. And I gotta be honest, playing an original DMG Game Boy in this day and age is kind of brutal. Not only is it not backlit, but you have to get like a perfect angle just to be able to see anything at all. But of course, if you're looking for that authentic experience, then nothing beats the DMG with Tetris. So let's say you want to upgrade the DMG experience with something a little bit better. Here's our next example. This is a modded original Game Boy. This one has a new shell and buttons, but then also a backlit LCD panel. Other than that, everything's kind of the same. It still runs on batteries, so it's a very familiar Game Boy experience. If you wanted to get something like this set up, it's going to cost you about $70 for all the parts, and then you'll have to install them into a Game Boy DMG. And so you'll have to factor in the price of the original model as well. And also bear in mind, this is not an easy installation process compared to the FPGBC. This does require soldering. Anyway, let's take a look at this experience next. Number one, it's a lot easier to see everything because it does have a backlit display. However, you also have to bear in mind that this LCD panel does not have all those colorization options that you might be used to. And so it remains a relatively black and white experience, which for me kind of feels very inauthentic just in the sense that it doesn't have that same colorization. And so while I do think it's pretty cool to be able to update an original Game Boy, this is not the experience for me at all. So let's try the next Game Boy that I have available for testing. This one is going to be a modded Game Boy Color. And this one's kind of a similar setup in that it has an aftermarket shell and new buttons and then also an IPS LCD display. And this LCD panel has a couple neat features, including a touch panel, which will allow you to change out your colorization. And the right side is also touch sensitive. This will allow you to increase and decrease the brightness. Other than that, it's a very similar experience to the FPGBC. On the right, we have our power toggle. And then on the left, we have our link cable port as well as a volume wheel. This one has also been modified with an aftermarket rechargeable battery, but it doesn't have a USB-C port. Instead, on the bottom, it has that 3.5 millimeter headphone jack and then a barrel plug for the charger. So let's go ahead and turn this one on. Again, we're going to stick with our Game Boy game of Tetris. And you have to bear in mind, this is an original Game Boy Color inside, which means that when you plug it in, it's going to colorize it just like it did with the original Game Boy Color. And I think in 1998, when the Game Boy Color first came out, this was pretty cool in the sense that it would colorize your game. But in today's age, I would rather have something a little bit more authentic. So let's try out the colorization options that are built in within the LCD panel. So if we tap on the top left, you will see that we will cycle through a bunch of different color options. I'm personally not a huge fan of this because it's just putting another color layer on top of the colorization that's already there. And of note, before we move on, here is what the brightness toggle is going to look like. You're just going to tap on the top right and it's going to cycle through the different options. 
Now, one of the neat things that is part of the Game Boy Color experience is that the BIOS does have different colorization options. And we have 12 different options. You can access the first four by holding onto the A button during the boot logo and then pressing up, down, left, and right. And you can do a similar thing by pressing and holding the B button and then cycling through the different D-pad directions. And then finally, if you don't press any buttons but use the D-pad, you can toggle through the last four. Personally, I prefer B and left. That's going to be your grayscale or black and white option. And this one I found works the best with the LCD colorization options that we have built into the panel. And so generally, if I am going to play a Game Boy game, this is what I will do. I'll play it in grayscale and then toggle through the different color options. Personally, I prefer the blue color option. It reminds me a bit of the Game Boy Light. So this is probably the most authentic colorization that I can get here on this platform. It's not the worst in the world, but it's still very apparent that you're playing a Game Boy game on a Game Boy Color. And also bear in mind that the screen is going to be smaller than the FPGBC, but what might surprise you is this is a lot more expensive. In fact, just to get the third party parts that you will need in order to upgrade an original Game Boy Color, it's going to set you back $84. And that's a dollar more than the entire FPGBC. And of course, bear in mind you still need the internals of a Game Boy Color to include with this whole setup. And depending on the pricing, you're looking at something that's well over $100 to get this all set up. And so I do find it ironic that a device that feels more limited than the FPGBC is a lot more expensive. And speaking of expensive, let's talk about our next handheld. This is going to be the Analog Pocket. Now, if you're into retro gaming and original hardware, you've probably heard of this thing before. It's been out for a couple years now, and I've covered it in quite a few videos. This thing is also an FPGA like the FPGBC, but a lot more powerful and performant. But for the purposes of this segment, we're only going to talk about it in terms of playing it like a Game Boy. And of note, this has a cartridge slot, which works with both Game Boy and Game Boy Color. It's a little bit on the wobbly side when playing these games in particular, but it definitely works. Before we get too far into the weeds, let's talk about price. Now, the Analog Pocket starts at $220. And bear in mind that that does not include shipping, and they have some of the most expensive shipping I've ever seen from any company. For example, shipping this device to me in Hawaii from the West Coast costs $60 altogether. And when you factor in things like tax and whatnot, you're looking at about $300 to get this device shipped to your door. And a couple other notes to bear in mind is that this device is perpetually out of stock, so it's very hard to actually pick one up. And Analog has a scarcity marketing campaign, which is really off-putting for me as well. They do have some color options here and there, but those are even more limited, and so you're really just going to be stuck with black or white for the most part. And so with all of that expense and price limitations in mind, let's take a look at what this thing can actually do. And to start, we're just going to play the cartridge itself. Now, this screen is probably one of the most amazing parts of the whole experience. This is actually a perfect 10x integer scale of the Game Boy and Game Boy Color, so everything is going to look perfect. Additionally, because because it's FPGA, it's going to feel almost exactly the same as playing on original Game Boy in terms of timing and audio. And when playing with a cartridge, we have a bunch of additional features. If we go into the settings, we can change out the Game Boy display options. And they've got a bunch of different color palettes, including the original Game Boy DMG, as well as Game Boy Pocket and Game Boy Light. And the other display modes look pretty good too. The analog GB one in particular works with a bunch of different color palettes. And so you can refine the color even more within here. You can even add a custom palette if you would like. For me personally, I prefer to keep it on the DMG display mode. I think it looks really nice. On top of that, we do have a couple other features. This one has a working sleep mode if you just tap on the power button. And then also it supports save state. So if you press the analog and up button while in gameplay, it's going to save your game. From there, if you press the analog button and go into the memory section, you can then browse through your different save states and then load them directly. And so I think that is insanely cool, the ability to use an original cartridge, but then also have save states attached to it. And I also love the fact that it has sleep mode like the FPGBC. Now, playing on original cartridges is not the only way to play games on the analog pocket. There are actually two other ways that you can boot up Game Boy and Game Boy Color games. The first one is going to be the open FPGA platform. I've also covered this a lot on my channel, but this essentially breaks open the entire device to be able to play a bunch of different FPGA cores. And we're not limited to just Game Boy and Game Boy Color. This can play things like different arcade ROM sets, and it can emulate home computers like the Amiga, and then also a bunch of home console systems, Super Nintendo, Genesis, TurboGrafx-16, the works. And in addition to the Game Boy and Game Boy Color, there are other handhelds like Game Boy Advance, Pokemon Mini, Game Gear, and WonderSwan Color. Additionally, depending on the platform, we have a couple different cores to choose from. In fact, we have 
have two different Game Boy cores, so let's go over those really quickly. We'll start with the most recent one, which is by someone called Boo Dude 2. And the main reason why I really like this core is because it has a bunch of different display options as well. And these are actually different and sometimes better than the ones you can find within the cartridge itself. For example, it has an original Game Boy DMG setting. And this one not only mimics the DMG color, but also makes it look all washed out like it did on the original display. I think this is totally unnecessary, but still very, very cool. And so I do really like this core. Not only can we play games from an SD card, but we have a bunch of different display mode options too. When it comes to playing Game Boy games, I really like this one called Backlit Color LCD. Now that being said, this core is not perfect. For example, unlike with the cartridge games, this one does not support save states. And it also does not have a working sleep function either. Next, let's take a look at the other core that's available. This is one of the original cores for this device. And this one's a little bit different because it does support save states, which is awesome. But this one, unfortunately, does not support any other display modes. You're just going to be stuck with this green colorization. And honestly, it doesn't look half bad, but I would rather have all of those color options that we had previously, but then also save states and sleep. And so in my opinion, neither of these open FPGA cores are perfect. And then finally, let's look at the last way that you can play Game Boy games on the analog pocket. And this is through a tool called GB Studio. And I covered this pretty extensively in my first analog pocket video a couple years ago. But essentially what you have to do is take your ROMs and then convert them over to GB Studio files. From there, you can launch them from the tool and they'll behave exactly like if you had plugged in an original cartridge. That means all those perks that we were talking about earlier, the display mode options, save states and sleep, all those are going to work. And so when it comes down to it, if you want to play Game Boy games and not directly from a cartridge, then I would recommend using GB Studio. This will give you all the perks of using a cartridge without having to put wear and tear on that game. Okay, so that was a quick look at all the various ways that you can play Tetris on these Game Boy-like handhelds. So now let's talk about what it's like to actually play it on the FPGBC that we're reviewing here today. And really, first and foremost, it's going to be a very simple experience. You're just going to plug in your cartridge, and as long as you're booting into the Game Boy Core, it's going to act exactly like an original Game Boy. And I really love this display. It's not perfectly integer scaled, but all the same, it's nice and bright and very big. Now in terms of gameplay, there's not a lot of additional features like you would find on the analog pocket. We can change out the different palettes, but we're not able to apply, for example, an LCD grid unless we use the 4x integer scale. And of course, you're not going to have anything like save states either, so you're going to have to rely on in-game saves if the game supported it. The only workaround to that that I found is just using the sleep function. This is obviously going to drain the battery pretty quickly, but if you're just going to put it down for a little bit and want to come back to it, this is probably what I would do. In the end, I still think it's a great Game Boy experience because it feels like you're playing on original hardware, but just elevated in many ways. And I think that leads to our next section because we can elevate this even further by using flashcards. And if you're not familiar with a flashcard, this essentially is something that will work like an original cartridge, but it has an SD card slot. And so you can essentially load up a bunch of different games onto this cartridge and then put it in your device and then have access to all of them at once. And there's a lot of reasons why this is awesome, but probably the most important thing is that it's not going to put wear and tear on your original cartridges which are probably aging right now. So let's take a look at the three that I chose for our testing. We're going to start with the Big Daddy. This is going to be the EverDrive GBX7. In general, the EverDrives are known as being the gold standard when it comes to flash carts. And this one's pretty impressive. It actually has a button within the cartridge. So if you press on the cartridge, it's going to open up an in-game menu. And that'll give you access to save states, which is pretty awesome for a flash cart. Now, these cartridges do not come cheap. In fact, right now, they're about $134 before shipping. And so as you can imagine, it's quite painful to purchase one of these. But if you are looking for the best flash cart that you can find, this one has the most features all around. Next up, we have the Easy Flash Jr. And in full disclosure, this was sent over to me by Senko Games. Now, this one has a lot of the same features as an EverDrive, but it does lack that save state feature. But the big perk here is that it's a lot cheaper. It's $46 from Senko Games with free shipping. And so really, this is almost a full $100 cheaper than the EverDrive. You're going to lack those save states, but you're saving a lot of money along the way. And this one also has a built-in button that will reset you back to the main menu. And finally, we have our third option. This one is called the Game Color G. GB. And this is a knockoff flash cart that I got on AliExpress and it's super cheap. It was like $21 with free shipping. Not only that, it also came with an SD card that was preloaded. It had the entire ROM set for all the different regions of Game Boy and Game Boy Color directly on this card. And that's obviously super shady, but also very convenient. And this one also has a built-in button that will reset to the main menu as well. So with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and start testing these different flash cards. We're going to start with the EverDrive. 
And this one's pretty interesting because sometimes it will actually work. What I found is that immediately after flashing a new firmware, if you use the EverDrive, it's gonna work flawlessly. So you can go into the menu, pick out your games, load them up. And if you press the button on the back, it's going to open up the in-game menu. You can save your state. And you can also go back, do the same process, and then load the state as well. And all that works perfectly. However, the big problem here is that as soon as you end that one game, you can no longer boot any game whatsoever. Every time you try to start up a new game, it's gonna give you a disk read error. And it doesn't matter what game you try. It could be the same game, it can be a new game, you can try it with the Game Boy Color or Game Boy Core, none of those are gonna work. And so unfortunately, even though EverDrive has the most features, including those save states, it's not a really viable solution, at least right now. And I assume this has to do something with the FPGBC firmware, so I do hope there's a fix somewhere down the line. Okay, next up, let's try the Easy Flash Junior. And unfortunately, this one won't even launch into the menu at all. As soon as you try to load it up, it's going to give you a micro SD card error. It doesn't matter if you're using Game Boy Color or the Game Boy Core, it's going to be the same result. And so unfortunately, as of right now, this one's not compatible either. I'm really hoping that we will see a firmware fix for these two down the line. And finally, let's try this cheapo one that cost me $21, and sure enough, this one boots up just fine. Now, unfortunately, this one doesn't have all the bells and whistles as the others, and so there are no save states or anything else like that. But at the very least, it's going to boot into all of your games, and so you have access to the entire Game Boy and Game Boy Color library from a single flashcard here. And you've got a wide variety of uses. You can launch this with the Game Boy Color Core or the Game Boy Core and all the options in between. In addition, using a flash cart opens up a whole new world of other games, including ROM hacks. For example, this one is called Tetris Rosy Retrospection. I've shown this on my channel before. This one's a mod of the original Tetris, but with some more recent features. For example, on the bottom, you can see a shadow of your Tetris piece as you move it along. And you've got a hold function, so if you press the select button, it'll move it into that box. Additionally, it gives you a preview of your next three pieces. And if you press the up button, it'll do an instant drop as well. So this is one of my favorite ways to play Tetris, because it's kind of like a mix between Tetris DS and the original Tetris. And so that's one of the ways that using a flash cart can really benefit your overall gaming experience. And it really doesn't stop there, there is a whole world of Game Boy and Game Boy Color mods out there. For example, this one is Pokemon Polished Crystal. This will give you the ability to go into the settings and make a bunch of different game tweaks if you would like. And there are also colorization mods for some older Game Boy titles. For example, Super Mario Land 2 DX is one of my favorites. This one actually feels like it was made for the Game Boy Color, and so I think that's pretty cool. So there are definitely some benefits to having a flash cart experience in terms of just consolidating all of your games into one, but then also trying out game mods. But there are some drawbacks as well. Let's do a quick comparison, starting with the EverDrive with my modded Game Boy Color, and then we've got our FPGBC running that AliExpress flash cart that we bought for 21 bucks. And then finally, Finally, on the right, we have the Analog Pocket running an open FPGA Game Boy Core. So the big drawback here is going to be the boot times and actually getting into a game with each of these. The fastest one is going to be the open FPGA Core, and honestly, the EverDrive on a modded Game Boy Color is not that far behind. However, that cheap flash cart from AliExpress really takes its time in starting up those games. It'll really depend on the size of the game itself, but then also whether or not it's your first time booting up that game. For example, here with Wario Land 3, this is my first time running it on this flash cart, and it took over 33 seconds to actually get there. And so that loading experience is over three times longer than both the EverDrive as well as the Analog Pocket. And that's kind of a bummer because I've always felt like the Game Boy and the Game Boy Color really thrive from this idea of pick up and play gameplay. And so if you do want to have the most frictionless experience with the FPGBC, then I would highly recommend using an original cartridge. When you turn it on, it's going to show the boot logo and then jump right into your game. By comparison, using a flash cart means that you'll see the boot logo and then the flash cart menu, and then you'll have to navigate to find your game and then boot that up. And like I mentioned, depending on the game, it might take quite some time to actually get it running. Once it does boot up, you'll have to see the Game Boy boot logo again, and then the game will finally start. And if you're looking to play the games in the easiest manner possible, then there's nothing beating that original cartridge experience. In fact, ever since getting my FPGBC, I've been on a tear in buying old Game Boy and Game Boy Color games as I find them. And this has been the most fun experience for me. If I'm going to be traveling or something like that, I can just grab the Game Boy and maybe just one or two cartridges. That allows me to really focus on the games that I'm playing, and the fact that they boot up so quickly is super Super awesome. So there are positives and negatives either way. With a flash cart, it's going to be cheaper to be able to play a bunch of games and you don't have to swap out the cartridges all the time. 
And of course, you'll have access to ROM hacks as well. However, the original cartridge is going to boot up faster and give you that more authentic experience, but it is a lot more expensive to get and maintain these cartridges. Either way, I think it's awesome that we can play both types of games on the FPGBC. I just wish it had support for other flash cards, including that EverDrive, so that we could get save states. Okay, next, let's talk about Link Cable, because this was pretty interesting for me as well. For all intents and purposes, this is supposed to work just fine, but I found that I was not able to connect it to anything. Sometimes I would get an error that said it was improperly linked or it lost connection, or sometimes with some games it just wouldn't connect at all. Now this is supposed to work, and so I'm not really sure what's going on here, but my first guess is that it's some sort of hardware failure. If I had to guess, I would say there's something wrong with my FPGBC port. At first I thought it was the cable, but connecting a Game Boy Color to my analog pocket, I was able to link them up, no problem. And so I've really got two ideas. The first is the hardware failure, like I mentioned before, which says a little bit about the quality control of the device itself. And then the second idea is that maybe the software on the FPGBC doesn't work with other devices, only other FPGBCs. Either way, I spent about an hour trying different link cable options and nothing would work with my FPGBC, which was kind of a bummer. So now that we've done all the testing that I wanted to do, let's do a bit of a comparison against the Game Boy and Game Boy Color options that we have available on the market. And I'm going to use these three as an example to illustrate my purposes. Again, on the left, we have my modded Game Boy Color. And then on the far right, we have our analog pocket. And then of course, in the center, we have the FPGBC. Let's start by talking about the display experience a little bit more in depth. And this time around, we're going to focus on Game Boy Color as opposed to Tetris in the original Game Boy. And to start, we're going to use an open FPGA core with Game Boy Color, and I'm going to use the one that has the different display mode options. I found that my favorite overall for Game Boy Color is this one called Original GBC LCD+. Plus. This one will desaturate the colors, but then also look very accurate, so let's stick with that one. Now on the left side, our modded Game Boy Color doesn't really have any sort of colorization options, so we are just stuck with how it looks by default. And because the way these games are programmed and how they look on modern displays, it is going to look oversaturated. In the center, we're going to do the exact same thing. So I'm going to blow up the screen to the full mode, but I'm not going to turn on the desaturation because of the issues with the color balance. And right off the bat, between the three, I would say they all look fairly good. But between the two on the left, I do prefer the FPGBC just because the display is larger and more impressive. And the colors between them just seem to be about the same anyway. Now between all three, definitely the analog pocket looks the best to me. Not only does it have desaturated colors, but it looks very accurate. And so in terms of display, I think that the analog pocket looks a lot better. It also doesn't hurt that the display is larger and has a 10x integer scale. Now like we already talked about, when turning on the desaturation mode with the FPGBC, it looks worse to me. For example, when looking at the words Mario Tennis, you can see that the word tennis has a green tint to it that is not found on the other devices. Same thing with the Wario Land logo. It's supposed to have a more peach color, but here you can see it's more greenish yellow. And so between these three, that's how I would rack up these screens. I like the analog pocket one the best, but I do like the bigger size on the FPGBC compared to a modded Game Boy Color. But also bear in mind, these are not your only options when it comes to modded systems. I just don't happen to have all of them. For example, recently there has been an OLED display released for the Game Boy Color, and a lot of people are really excited about this. Now personally, I'm not super stoked on this idea just because I feel like an OLED display is just going to make it even more saturated. And so it's kind of moving in the opposite direction of what I would like. Not only that, it's quite expensive. It's $55 for the display and the shell alone. That means you're going to have to bring your original Game Boy Color as well as the buttons and membranes and the batteries as well. So this one also does look to be a pretty expensive option compared to the FPGBC. So all things considered, when looking at the FPGBC, I would say that the display is definitely worse than the analog pocket, but on its own, I think it is still plenty good. Anytime I've been playing a Game Boy Color game, I've really enjoyed the experience. Yes, there is a better display option out there, but it is also about three times the price as this one. And so just in terms of sheer value, when it comes to playing Game Boy Color games, I think the FPGBC is a really big win. And in terms of Game Boy, it's a very similar experience when comparing these screens as well. Honestly, I don't think that the modded Game Boy Color is really even worth comparing with because this one just doesn't have the colorization options and none of them look really correct. And so I generally just don't like to play Game Boy games on a Game Boy Color for those reasons. Now between the analog pocket and the FPGBC, Yes, I think that the analog pocket is more accurate and just looks a lot better. But again, it just comes back to that same experience where I feel like it is good enough. 
especially when you consider the fact that it's coming in at $83 for the entire experience. So in the end, if we are going to be nitpicky about these screens and we want to get the best one possible, then yes, I don't think the FPGBC is the best one out there. It comes in a solid second place. But again, we're really just talking about the display, and when it comes down to it, a handheld gaming device is more than the sum of all its parts. And while there's no denying that the visual experience could be better on the FPGBC, as a whole, I enjoyed playing the FPGBC more than any of my other Game Boy-like handhelds that I've owned to date. And a lot of that comes down to the other factors that are not easily explained by the differences in display. For example, it has pitch-perfect controls and a familiar shape and weight, and also those accurate FPGA cores for Game Boy and Game Boy Color. Not only that, it is just chock-full of nostalgia. A lot of that comes from the fact that it's using a Game Boy Color shell, but when we look at the overall combination of everything, nothing has really transformed me back to those Game Boy-loving childhood days quite like the FPGBC. And don't get me wrong, when we're only specifically looking at Game Boy and Game Boy Color, the analog pocket is still really excellent in that regard. It has display and visual features that are a lot better, the colors are more authentic, and that 10x integer scale is really impressive. When it comes down to it, the analog pocket screen certainly makes it look like a Game Boy or a Game Boy Color. But the thing is, it doesn't really feel like one. The face buttons are very matte feeling and have a lot of wobble or play to them, and the D-pad is similarly loose and powdery feeling. Now they're not bad controls, but I also wouldn't call them Game Boy controls either. On top of that, I've never been a huge fan of the shape and ergonomics of the analog pocket, which to me feels more like it was designed with 3D renders in mind than actual hands. The front edges in particular are a lot sharper than I would like them to be, and that does get in the way of my gaming experience. Now to be clear, the analog pocket is amazing in many other ways, and it's a triumph of handheld gaming if you value accuracy over everything. It's really amazing all the systems that it can play, and so accurately. However, when taken as a whole, especially when compared to the FPGBC, it almost feels like the analog pocket has a bit of an identity crisis. After all, it looks like a Game Boy, but it doesn't really feel like one. It can also play a ton of different systems, and some of these are really elevated experiences thanks to the highly accurate FPGA cores. But in the context of playing Game Boy games, when you have all those devices at your fingertips, it kind of makes it feel like it doesn't know what it is. Is the analog pocket a Game Game Boy, a Nintendo, a Super Nintendo, a Sega Genesis, or an arcade machine, it's kind of all of them, but it's also none. On the other hand, the FPGBC knows exactly what it is. It's a Game Boy, and it's a Game Boy Color, and it feels like a Game Boy Color. It also has some really important improvements, like a sleep function, a backlit display, and a USB-C charging port. In fact, if I closed my eyes and I tried to imagine what a perfect Game Boy would look like, this little guy would be pretty darn close. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself, and I'm getting to the conclusion before we even do the wrap-up. So let's go and do that next and talk about what I like and what I don't like about the FPGBC. And number one here is the fact that we have a mostly authentic experience. Now of course this doesn't have any original parts, but the fact that it's using a Game Boy Color-like shell really elevates that experience a lot. And of course it's using hardware emulation to elevate that even further. I also like this nice and big screen, and it's going to work really well in a brightly lit environment because it does get very bright. I also appreciate that the software has been getting regular updates, about one a month at this point. I also like that you can buy this as a kit and customize it however you would like, get a different color shell or buttons, and kind of swap that all out. In the end, that's probably one of my other favorite features, that it feels like a project handheld. It's kind of like putting a Lego set together, but with a video game console at the end of it. I also really appreciate the USB-C charging port. The fact that I don't need a proprietary cable to get this charging is pretty cool. And finally, this is a killer price point especially compared to a modded Game Boy or a Game Boy Color. For $83, you get something that can be both a Game Boy and a Game Boy Color, and in my opinion, it's better than the modded ones as well. But of course, it's not perfect, so let's talk about some of the things I don't like about the FPGBC. And to be honest, a lot of these are going to be software-based. Number one is the fact that we don't have a lot of flash cart compatibility. I'm really crossing my fingers and hoping that we will be able to play this with an EverDrive, because I think if we can play this with save states, it's really going to increase its playability. I was also a little perplexed by the link cable issues that I had. No matter what what combination I used, it didn't work, and so I'm not sure if this was a hardware failure or if it only works with other FPGBCs. 
Next, it does feel like this device is a bit of a work in progress. After all, over the past six months, we've seen three different revisions to the PCB. Not only that, it's great that we're getting these software updates, but it does kind of feel like we're building the train as it's already running. So if you are looking for something that's a more mature experience, I don't think this one is going to be a very good fit. And finally, my last point may not apply to you. After all, if you're watching this very long video about a fake Game Boy, then you're probably in this specific use case anyway. But my point here is that this is a very specific use case. This device is really targeted for people who want to play with original hardware, but with a little better of an experience over the modded hardware that you can get. If you're looking for a software emulator, this is not it. You can get something like the Mio Mini Plus for like $55. That's going to play Game Boy and Game Boy Color just fine, but then also a bunch of other systems too. So the value in this device is not the fact that it can only play two systems. The value in it is the fact that it replicates that original experience. And like I mentioned, this is the first device where I feel like it is capped capturing the original spirit of the Game Boy and Game Boy Color, but then also making it better in just about every way. So when it comes down to it, if you're asking whether or not I recommend this device, then yeah, of course, I think it is totally worth $83 if this is the type of device that you want to play. After all, I've spent many weeks working on this device and this video just to show you how awesome it really is. When it comes down to it, if you think that something like this is a good fit for you or maybe one of your loved ones, then yes, I wholeheartedly agree. It's really going to be a factor of whether or not you think that the software right now is up to speed for your expectations. I certainly hope that it's going to get better, but there's no guarantee that we're going to see something like better flash card compatibility down the line. So the way I see it, if you're good with how it is right now, then yes, this is a must buy, and it might actually get better over time as well. So let me know what you think in the comments down below. Is the FPGBC the handheld for you, or would you rather spend your money on something else? As always, thank you for watching this very long video, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.